We have five days to complete a bucket list hike that most people do in 10. We have three months to train for it. Let's see if we can pull it off. Here comes him, catch a cow. <laughs> it's legit snowing right now and it's August. This is it, stage five of the hard line challenge. We set out on this journey to show you that with some mental and physical preparation, you too can go out there and complete your bucket list hikes even without having to take all this extra time off of work to do so. Our goal is to complete our bucket list hike, the Uinta Highline Trail, over 100 miles of high elevation trail in half of the time by covering twice as many miles as most backpackers do. To see what it actually took to get here, make sure to check out the full playlist of the Hardline Challenge up here in the corner. Needless to say, this was a challenge we will never forget. So did we all complete the trail? Well, you're just gonna have to watch and find out in this episode, the final episode of the Hardline Challenge. When we woke up, um, we woke up around six in the morning and we were all pretty excited to get started. That's been a trail that I've wanted to do for, for years. I had thought about it personally and then I just randomly got the invite to join the guys after being in the company to go do you and a Highline. I was like, hey, that's been on my bucket list for a while. The uh, Uinta Highline Trail is a trail that goes through the entire range of the Uintas, um, basically as close to the center line as you can or the highest point which is why I think it gets its name Highline. What it equates to on paper is usually 104 miles long. Uh, the route that we had to do would have been 107 miles long. So talking about a lot of miles and 80 plus percent of it, probably about 85% of it is over 10,000 feet in elevation. So ever since 2018, when we took our crew to King's Peak, I have wanted to do this trail. And in 2019, when we brought Brigham on, it was on top of his bucket list. And that's all we've been able to talk about for a long time today we start the high line. I, I knew from the beginning that I wasn't going to be able to make this. I had two kids starting school um, that week. Uh, one was going to her first day of kindergarten. The other was starting his first day of third grade. You know, my wife's amazing. She, she sacrifices and watches these kids as I go on these trips. But in this instance, uh, I just kind of need to step up as a, as a father and, uh, and be, the, be there for these for these events that may seem small but in the big picture are bigger things. Doing the High Line in five days is quite an undertaking considering that most people do it in eight to ten days but we figured that there was a few advantages by us doing it faster. The first was we wouldn't have to do any sort of resupply with food but the other was we could fit it all in a work week and uh, we wouldn't have to be away from the family that long. The trail was really rocky, um, just slightly gradually uphill for most of day one, and uh, we were all in pretty good spirits. Doing a breakfast skillet from Peach, and I remembered my spoon. Look at that bite. Just, just look at it. Derek well, that many of you are probably familiar with it. I struggled with quite a bit of knee pain throughout stage four, and that's something that I've dealt with since I've had plenty of injuries. I've had double knee surgeries, played football and rugby in high school, and then played a year of rugby in college. But I felt good. I felt really good. I did some kind of rehabbing. I looked into orthotics, looked into a few things. Oh, yeah. This is why we're skeptical when Taysen asks us if we want to go on a hike. Day one of the High Line was going to be our driest day, meaning that we had almost a 20 mile stretch with no um, running water to filter. We had to camel up, we had to drink a bunch of water and uh, pack a bunch more water than we like to get through that 20 mile stretch. I'm either hallucinating and need to stop or there's really a snake under that log you just stepped off of. <laughs> just found the trail again. It was lost. We knew where we were but the trail was lost. There's a little bit of route finding some places in the forest, the trail is not super clear. But it was, the weather was great um, that first morning. We're just walking through piles of boulders and then there's these cairns that are just taller piles of boulders. It was, it was a pretty long feeling day. The trail got lost again. 
uh, but I think we're gonna find it real soon. Bacon bits, salami, little things, mayonnaise packets, oh, yeah. <laughs> and a big old fat tortilla. We stop and, and, and have a lunch break. And at this point, we'd been going for, I don't know, four hours or so, maybe five. Ate my lunch just as normal, probably hiked like another mile and a half. And we just like stopped for a water break because we didn't really have water for the good chunk of that day. And we were stopping, just relaxing for a little bit. It's like, hey, I think I'm gonna head to the restroom. And just literally thought I had to go to the bathroom. The second like I get to the spot where I've chosen to go to the bathroom, like <coughs> my stomach just like turned upside down <coughs> instantaneously. Like it went from just feeling unsettled to like, okay, I'm gonna throw up right now. And I probably threw up like maybe seven times. So he finishes up and he's like, I feel way better. And, and uh, we're like, okay. And, and so we pack up and get moving again. And after like an hour or two, he starts feeling sick again. He was not feeling good for quite a while. That's not something that you want to see or hear that early on in a trip where your window of time is very tight and the margin of error is very tight. But he's a trooper. He proved that last stage, stage four. He pushed through a lot of different difficulties with his knees and he kind of proved that when he puts his mind to something, he can do it. And so we decided to, you know, let's just keep going. Again, we are currently in the losing the trail phase. This is the uh, internal conversation going on up there with Payson. Where the heck are we? Greg, I'm, well, I don't know, weren't you supposed to be leading this outfit? Payson's <laughs> like, I thought you were in charge. It's a part of being backcountry and then the further back you get, the less maintenance gets done on the trails and the less traffic there is. Should be expected. Only four more miles to go and 900 feet of elevation <laughs> before camp. If anybody asked my dad how far away we were, or if we were close, no matter what, he would always say about an hour. <laughs> would be like, driving to Utah from California would be like Reno. <laughs> It's about an hour. Mile 24.8. How you doing that, Brennan? Loving the green. I was not doing too hot, obviously, after I'd been throwing up for a while. And the last probably five miles up to where that lake where we wanted to be was pretty uphill. Lost a lot of energy, started hitting a calorie wall because I couldn't keep food down and didn't really want to be drinking because anything that I drank just upset my stomach instantly. Uh, that was a little bit of a crazy one. I threw up like four times. So definitely lost all my water at about mile 15. We were just in time to be able to set up our tents in the light, but we didn't have long. It was get to camp, set up tents, and then the sun was pretty much down. My legs are definitely feeling more tired after today's 25 miler than the beaver. 26 and a half mile. We're pretty good. Um, I think there's just a lot of euphoria from just being here. Here's my biggest problem. This is a large hip belt and with my weight loss, I have maxed it out. That's as tight as it goes. And I could use a tighter hip belt for sure. So that was a little bit annoying today, but luckily I'm built like an old man so I can tuck this up and just kind of stick my gut out a little bit and it grips it all right. I did have so. an 11,000 calorie dinner, so. 11,000 calories? <laughs> oh, no, 1,100, sorry. If I'm ready to sleep right now, this will be a good night. I got red, silver, yellow, black. Gotta test them all, I guess. How are you feeling this morning, man? Uh, Kid-friendly version is not too hot. Not too hot. <laughs> Did you have to get up at all last night? Yeah, I threw up three times last night. Day two was beautiful. It's the end of tree line up there, right at the top. Such a pleasant morning. We, we started realizing like how nice it was to have just water available everywhere. There's streams flowing everywhere and just nice green grass that you're just walking by a place where you could lay down and just take a nap at any given time. Brendan's taking a nice little morning siesta. I didn't, I, I, I'm not, never one to give up. That was like pretty much my motivator. So I don't give up. I snacked on like some fruit snacks that morning and didn't feel super sick. So like, hopefully maybe I can get some food down. So I just decided keep going. I can live in the cabin in that valley.
Most of day two consisted of me being on my own. Brandon's still been feeling pretty sick today. So he's been taking shorter breaks and hiking slowly. But we took our break and we only left a little while. Look how far ahead he is. So how I hike is very different than how they hike. I do not stop for meals, really, except for dinner. So I'm almost always an eat on trail type of person. And I don't know if that affected me in any way, just because they were stopping for larger, bigger meals that I wasn't used to. So I just decided like, hey, I'm gonna go back to my roots. I'm just gonna eat on trail. I'm just not gonna stop all day. Well, the big thing is like, I'm just trying to hold, I just wanted to hold down. Yeah. If I go too fast, I throw up any of that's what's gonna ruin me. Any amount that you can hold down is a, is a game. Yeah. He was just not doing good through that. We covered a ton of country above tree line, went over like two major passes and uh, he just wasn't really making any improvements and we were really worried that he just wasn't getting the hydration and the calories that he needed to sustain himself. We don't really know if it's elevation sickness or if he got a stomach bug or if it's overexertion or all three. Brennan had mentioned that he had some theories about maybe why he was feeling so sick. The night before we actually started the trail, uh, we met up and we actually grabbed a bite to eat at a restaurant and uh, I thought it was pretty good, but he, he kind of mentioned a few times throughout the week that, you know, I bet it was that restaurant we ate at before we started the trail and he, he really thought that he was having some like food poisoning or something. My hunch would be that him taking both of the elevation medications together was what made him sick. We had done a lot of research and we got our doctors to prescribe a preventative um, elevation sickness medicine that we could start taking a few days before the hike that would help with elevation sickness. But then we also had an emergency uh, prescription that was meant to help clear water out of the lungs if you had like a true pulmonary attack from the elevation. Brendan's doctor told him to take both from the get-go. Um, if it was elevation pills, I took one of the pills. I took one pill the night before, so I was only supposed to, I was take, to take the pill two times a day, one pill two times a day, and they say just take your first pill 24 hours before ascent. So I took one pill probably about an hour before we ate the first day, like traveling up to Highline. And then I took one pill the first morning and I made sure to do it with food. As the doctor said, took everything with food. And then once I got sick, I didn't want to take any pills, really. I know we didn't diagnose what happened to Brennan or me even on stage four, but I really think the elevation and your body adapting to that, along with the amount of stress and load coming into it, I think that has to play in at some point. Other than Brendan feeling sick, things were going really well. At one point, actually, Tayson and Tyler, they brought these little uh, fly fishing rods. We got to this really pretty basin with a nice stream coming through, and as we got there, I said, yeah, that's where the fish are, you know, and, and uh, you know, kind of pointed out, like, yeah, you drop a line in there, drop a fly over there. The guys stopped and fished for, you know, 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> Oh, guy. Back in the go. water. So I'm pretty new to fly fishing, but I do know one thing. Do what Master Brigham says. <laughs> he said, throw your fly right here. The stream looks good. Threw the fly right there and uh, caught three little trout. We're coming pretty close to where the Highline Trail goes by this lake, but uh, we're going by the end of the lake that just happens to have an owl house can dump some trash, if sit on a trash, throne. If there's a trash bag. Oh, that's true, if there's a trash bag. So sad day, we just checked and there's not a trash in there. So unfortunately we will be carrying all of our trash with us on this trip. Mile 17, a lot of boulders. I think we're all feeling the tender feet from just the sheer amount of rocks that we've covered today. At probably five or six out of time right now. For how you're feeling. Yeah, like this morning was a two. Last night was a zero. Thought you were gonna die last night. I did not feel good, bad. 
he just wasn't really making any improvements and we were really worried that he just wasn't getting the hydration and the calories that he needed to sustain himself. Like for him to not be able to eat or drink on the second day meant that the third, fourth, and fifth days were just gonna be horrible for him. I had one and a half tortillas and a handful of high chews that whole day on another 20 mile day that I was just kind of on my own and maybe drinking a liter and a half of water. And that's all I could keep down. The passes get significantly more intense. I could just tell how much I was like slowing them down. And just in that time, like they were conversing like, hey, do you think we should try to do the last pass or do you think we should camp at the base? Either way, starting with Anderson Pass, that's gonna be quite a climb. And if anybody goes to King's Peak, that's even more of a climb. We started looking at the map and thinking that we were maybe like three miles off each day. So we could either be like right on 106 miles or it could end up being like 115. And then instead of having like one short day where we only do 12 miles, we're gonna have th three more 20 mile days. I felt pretty confident that if I could just eat enough food to kind of like satisfy my basic bodily needs, like maybe not try to get 3,000 calories, but get like 1,000 calories a day, I'd be fine. But what was concerning is like, it wasn't the food that was upsetting my stomach, it was the water. There was just one point out there towards the end of day two where there was a road that came up to a lake that we were gonna be passing. And so we kind of all looked at that as like the deciding point of, of how, like whether he should keep going or not. We're down in a basin. We had one last pass at the final part of the day. And uh, that was when we stopped for kind of dinner and made the decision where I was gonna come off the trail. Just finished texting some people through Taysen's GPS. So we're making sure, absolute for sure, that we're just gonna have people to help him bail and take care of him here. I'm just walking down that road for a few days. <laughs> at, least, at, least you got, at least you got food for a few days. I wanted them to be able to enjoy that trail that is their dream trail, you know, and have them have that complete experience of being on you into Highline. That's what it is. It's just being on you into Highline, not being dragged around or having me be on my own for three days. He really showed a lot of grit, like going through that second day. Overall, what would you give it as a rating at a zero out of 10? 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10, even though you're puke six times. Yeah, I'm I'm frustrated to be leaving. I wouldn't, wouldn't really want to be anywhere else, so. I think it was the right thing to do. I mean, it, there wasn't gonna be an opportunity for an exit strategy like that for a long time. Being on top of peaks and just like summiting and being on the actual Highline Trail and then dipping down into these beautiful, beautiful basins full of lakes and pines. Like it's just such a good change up and just my favorite scenery is high elevation lakes and we've seen plenty of them. So it's been amazing. We used the, the inReach to text his mom who talked to his brother and, and we made arrangements for him to be picked up at that lake the following morning. And uh, then when dinner was over, he went backwards down the trail a mile and a half or two miles to the lake and we went the other way. We've got to get up that pass and around the backside of this big mountain. We knew we had a fairly significant pass coming up in, uh, in a few miles and we knew we wanted to be up and over that pass to our predetermined camp site. And uh, we also knew that the weather was the weather was coming. 7.40. Oh, I thought it was already eight, so we're ahead. 7.40. We gapped the clock here on the way up. It definitely does feel like go time now because the storm's rolling in and that there's side a looks lot worse of... than this side right now. You feel the humidity in the air. You can see the clouds converging on each other. The darkness of the clouds was coming. We had to try and bust up and over this pass as quick as possible, uh, knowing that like, if there's lightning, you gotta have like a point of no return where like once you're committed past that point, if there's lightning, you have to get down the mountain. So it's all, it's just which side of the pass do you go down? This is why we call Taysen Gandalf. He's got the beard tie and the rain tilt. And we are marching up to the top of Mount Mordor. We will pass. <laughs> I juiced up, I threw a bunch of gummy bears in my mouth, you know, to get some, some, some sugar and uh, we, started making our way up and over that pass. We just clicked off mile 23. 
we're still climbing over this high mountain pass. Starts pouring rain. It is just coming down so hard and it's dark. The sun is going down at the same time the clouds are getting thicker and thicker and thicker. So it makes you feel alive right here. Last year, almost the same week, I was getting frostbite in Alaska. This week, doing a freaking dream hike. Getting beat down by the rain. Loving life. That's where memories are made. In the moment, I was freezing cold. I was wearing shorts, I was soaked to the bone. Every inch of me was just frozen and I didn't have a light. But we get going over this pass and we start dropping down and at this point it is pitch black with the clouds and the storm and the rain still coming down and I can't see anything. And so what we end up doing is Tyler turns on a light and he's kind of walking behind me. Tayson's a little ways up on the trail. He's got his light on and then there's me. I'm just kind of like using some trekking poles and trying to pick my way around these huge rocks and not trip and not like fall down the steep side, you know, on the side of the trail. And, but uh, we made it work and and definitely <laughs> made me a believer in headlamps and bringing a headlamp where I can still use my hands and also still have, have a light. We have made it. We've got our camps mostly set up. I think it was a good day. I, I actually really enjoyed it. The last part was crazy, but it was an adventure. There was some fun, and then there was some type two fun. And some not fun. <laughs> and then some plain not fun. <laughs> but I think you have to have some plain not fun to have like a real adventure. Otherwise it doesn't really count. Yeah, so day three was supposed to be our easier day. It's rained. Pretty literally all night long. We originally planned to be up and out of here by now, but this rain has uh, caused us all to pause and think. When we woke up, it was transitioning from rain to sleet and snow. I didn't really want to get up this morning, but when I did, I got up to snow. It's legit snowing right now and it's August. When we got out of the tents, the whole entire mountainside and the entire valley was just running water. And I could not believe that the water just wasn't running straight under our tent. Somehow in the dark, in our delirium of getting into camp late, we picked a pretty good camp spot. It's looking like we're gonna do 20 miles today in the sleet and snow and rain. So our shorts, like I said, they were already wet from the night before. Same with our socks and our shoes. And we were just soaked and freezing from the get-go on day three. And we were antsy to get moving as soon as possible. All right, I'm freezing, <laughs> snowing. We've gone 0.83 miles. This is our pace of, uh, we're calling it trail power walking. It's really hard on the quads. Burns a lot of calories, but it keeps us warmer. We're doing interval runs between our walks, basically running the flats out here in the open because they're colder, and then walking as quick as we can through the pines to stay warm. I mean, we're prepared for, for rain. Um, I'd say I wasn't at that point, I wasn't in danger of hypothermia, you know. Thinking about hot showers and hot chocolate. And hot babes. <laughs> hot wife. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, cut that one. The minute we like leave our immediate vicinity of where we set up all the tents and stuff, there's just running and standing water everywhere. Look at how much snow is up there. That pass is gonna be garbage <laughs> go through today. This is supposed to be our rest day of like 14 easy miles, but I think we're gonna end up doing that pass, make it a 17, 18 mile day, and apparently walk and battle through snow. The last time I was on that thing, there was so much snow, I was so scared for my life. I was digging in each trekking pole just because I was scared of slipping and falling down, but I don't think we're gonna be doing King's Peak. It's just too, gnarly of weather for it.
I'm convinced that every trail in the Uintas is actually just a dry riverbed. The second there's any rain, they're just rivers. And so we're basically walking on the side of the trail, navigating up and over logs and around things and jumping rock to rock to rock on the trail, which just takes so much more energy out of you and, and it's kind of demoralizing when you're, when you're trying to track your pace, you know, and, and you're just not able to keep like a three mile an hour pace or, or whatever it is. It gets frustrating and it gets tiring. Hallelujah. We're getting some uh, direct sunlight on this grass. We're having to basically skirt along the trail the entire time. I got the skirt! <laughs> it was, it was not, it was not fun uh, for, for me at that point. I just don't like being that cold and wet. But we were making good good time covering ground quite well for the conditions. <laughs> what happened to your shoe? It didn't get wet, it just got bumped. It did that for a couple hours at least, you know, at least before around lunchtime. I just don't want it to be slick, because it, like, I you remember looking off that side and just being like, that's just a cliff over there that they put the trail down, you know? What if we could get there at three, you know? Yeah, to, hour, to really. Anderson Pass. Yeah. We took a moment to pull a weather report on the Garmin. We saw a big storm coming into Kings Peak, and we knew that if it snowed or if the storm hit that peak too hard, it was going to be dangerous to be up there in the lightning, but it was also going to be dangerous coming off the backside of it down Anderson Pass. So from then on, we hustled a lot more. We got into some different types of terrain as we got further and further away from North Pole Pass. We're walking through a boulder field right now because the trail through the meadow is complete swamp. And we were heading towards this, this big high elevation basin, the end of which there is Anderson Pass and Kings Peak, which is the tallest peak in Utah. That. A mountain that disappears into the snow clouds behind Taysen is King's Peak. And uh, the pass that we're trying to get through is that lowest point over there. We can see the pass. We can see what the weather's doing. We can see what the clouds are doing. And you can tell looking at it, like you can tell when it's raining, when it's snowing, or when it's just clouds. And the whole time we're approaching the pass, it's looking good. It's looking like, yeah, it's cloudy up there, but there's no thunder, there's no lightning happening, it's not raining or snowing. By the time we got to the bottom of Anderson Pass, um, we were pretty late. It was like 3.30. And right as we start getting closer to Anderson Pass, the clouds start changing again. They start getting a little bit more angry. That was when we hit the sheep herd that we kind of figured there would be guard dogs with. Those dogs have been known to chase off people the same way that they chase off uh, other predators. And Taysen had been attacked by some dogs from uh, another altercation a week before. You got a good one right there, and then look at this one. Uh, my bruise so, is kinda dissipated. Um, yeah, so I get I get first rights at not getting bit this time. No reason for, like, any more people to get an infection. He's already got an infection. Bye. Anyway, we start making our way through the herd of sheep, and getting up to kind of the steeper part of the pass. You know, we saw the sheep herders. I believe it's from Peru. Um, and he didn't speak a lick of English, so I was able to talk to him and, and, and understand some things. And he was asking, what are you guys doing? And, and are you guys you know, going up to King's Peak? We're like, no, 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 we're just gonna go up and over the pass right by the peak, but we're not going clear up to the top. And he's like, good, because if you were, you'd be Idiots, basically. <laughs> he was he was saying that because of the weather. And, and as a sheep herder that lives up there, just watching the sheep, I mean, he, he deals with the weather, pretty familiar with the weather patterns up there. And he knew, like, that's bad news. So in 2018, we climbed this peak, climbed King's Peak in this pass, and they absolutely wrecked me. I thought that I was training, I dropped weight, um, but they were really, really tough on me. So this is kind of revenge for me, even though we've already hiked about 16 miles to get here. I'm looking forward to crushing this pass um, I've learned a ton about how to prepare for stuff like this. I was definitely doing it wrong in 2018, so hopefully that pans out for me as we head up here. We start booking up Anderson Pass, and we're gonna hike so fast. We're like, we're gonna beat this storm. Let's just go real fast and get up and over, right? Yep, we're starting to get hit by cold rain. We got about halfway up, and 
everything went to pieces. Lightning and snow and hail just start coming down. We might need to turn around, guys. Like, this is getting dangerous. And Derek's like, no way. But geared up for this mentally all day long. Like, I'm not turning around. I wanted to do it. But we start talking about what would be the smartest thing. And I think Tyler is really the one that brought the voice of reason into this conversation. Knowing how far we have to go once we get over the pass, I would say it's, I would probably vote for the conservative option and go back down and camp. I really don't care too much about the, the last couple miles after the pass. Yeah, that, for me, that doesn't, doesn't like, I just feel like it's gonna be, thing. to me, the safety thing is the pass. Should we push through the lightning so that we can get over it? But at the same time, it looked like the snow was coming from the backside. So we knew that going down the pass was gonna be pretty treacherous even if we didn't get struck by lightning. We don't have a guarantee that there won't be a storm in the morning too. Well, so it starts off with a 40% chance and then just gets better throughout the day to 10%. Oh man, that's failed out. We all really wanted to get up over the pass. There's just that anticipation of wanting to just, just wait another minute to see if like miraculously it dies down and not wanting to have to make that call to turn around. It didn't, it did not get better. It did not die down. The rain intensified, the wind intensified, and then the lightning just started crashing all over the place. Okay, Tyler, three lightnings, five minutes or less. It doesn't make me want to keep going up. Yeah. Uh, let's wow. just go then. It's getting colder the longer we stand. Yeah. And once we decided to come down, that was when the lightning got worse. And as we were going down, it was really slick. Literally the entire mountainside was just running water and uh, and it was hailing on us like really hard and we were in shorts and that was like stinging our cold legs. We're all like sprinting down the side of the mountain like take cover. Whoa. That, that was that close. Was like one second away. Yeah. That hail is stinging our calves really bad, like really painful. But then the lightning got so bad that we had to like take shelter under these like little four and five foot tall pine trees that were just like in this little clump. And we hung out in that clump of trees for like, I think it was right around 40 minutes while the lightning was just pounding all around us. Like. Yeah, literally we were watching it all day as we walked, <laughs> nothing. As soon as we step our feet on it, freaking lightning storm with hail. Our legs were cramping from being crouched so long and holding that same position and trying to keep low because we also didn't want to be higher than those old trees. The rain backed down just a little bit at that point. But when we got down to the basin where the sheep were, the, uh, the there were two sheep herders that were just huddled in their full rain suits, you know, like, they were well supplied. They had these full heavy duty rain suits and they were just standing there next to this tree. And as we walked up to them, they were kind of just like smiling at us. And I think they just thought like, these guys are nuts. So we come walking up and meanwhile, you know, keep in mind, I've got my beard uh, and, and I've got a kilt on, a rain kilt, which is killer by the way. Um, but we come back down and I think they look at us again and just like, these guys look ridiculous. Like, hey, can we get your picture? Sure, you can have our picture. They take a picture. Next thing we know, he's like, hey, can I get in the picture with you? It's like jumps in the picture. It takes a picture with us. I think we made their day. I mean, they, we, we probably should have gone back to their tent for, you know, they offered us to come back to their tent, get a cup of coffee, but I think we all just wanted to go down and go to sleep. So they gave us a good tip on a campsite spot. A couple of sheep herders down there, they pointed this hill to us out. Said there was this wind bit break and kind of surrounded by trees. And they said no water flows here. I think by the time we got to camp, we were sitting at like 17 plus miles, um, which seems easy compared to our other days, but it was like harder miles than any other day. It felt like because of all the off trail and hurry up and wait and stop and run. And, and, and it was just kind of chaotic. We are up here on a hill, but we're surrounded by little trees. Um, of course, we got two guys with the two person tent, so they take the best spot. Brigham takes another spot and there's this little cubby that was like super out of the wind. And I'm like, I think my tent's big enough to get in there. Um, I pitch it in there and it ended up being a terrible decision. 
But by the time it was set up, I just didn't want to mess with it. Probably the worst pitch you could ever have. <laughs> Pools of water. The whole thing has shifted. Because um, I can't get any farther that way. It's just a, it's just a mess. Lots of water in here already from being wet last night and in the snow and no time to dry out today and here we are. It's like 5.30 in the morning and uh, we've got a lot of snow. Seven o'clock. What's it look like out there? Oof. I mean, that's shorts weather, right? <laughs> that sucked. Um, basically, just kind of laid there thinking about every scenario. It's slick back, but slick back's even covered in sickness, and so that's pretty hairy. I just keep thinking about how bad it would suck to get up and over this pass through the snow and be freezing and then get to Porcupine and not be able to get over it in the afternoon. So that's what we're, that we're thinking about is like, what's the snow situation on not just this pass, but we got, you know, two or three more passes today to do. We had some weather forecasts that had been pulled on some of the Garmin devices we were using and there was, there was hope. There was hope that there would be a break in the weather, but not a lot, just just some. So we were deciding, okay, we're gonna wait till 10 a.m. and we're gonna poke our heads out of the tent every half hour until then to see if there's a big enough break in the weather where the, where the sky is clear and we can get up and over Anderson Pass. All right, so we got up this morning. We're hoping that we'd see what we wanted to see to be able to make it over this pass. But realistically, it snowed all last night. And, well, not all last night, but it turned to snow. It rained all last night, turned to snow this morning. We had a bunch of snow up on our tents. And so we laid in our tents for a couple hours talking about it. And realistically, it's just not safe to continue. If we go up through this, on the back side, it gets really steep. Um, which is kind of scary when there's, you know, six to 12 inches of snow up there. Plus we're all in shorts and trail runners. We just really did not plan for this. In fact, I have the warmest gear probably, and that's because I have a two and a half ounce rain skirt. So that tells you how prepared we really are for something like this, but we're gonna have to make the hard call of heading back home. Um, if we went through the pass and we tried to call it later, it'd be much more difficult. We've got a way out of the wilderness right here, which is really our best access point by far. It's somewhere around 12 to 14 miles to a trailhead. So we're gonna head down the trail and get off the mountain. We're super bummed. We've been planning this for a long time. It's a bucket list hike. We're gonna have to come back. That pass right there, Anderson Pass, uh, I came back for some revenge and did not succeed. It just keeps telling me that I shall not pass. So solidifies my name a little bit of Gandalf, I guess, and uh, we'll have to come back. And this time, I think I'll just bring some mountaineering gear the next time and and uh, make sure that it happens. Anyways, we're gonna take off through this pass over here and uh, hoof it down to the trailhead and hopefully be out of here by tonight. The other thing that Jason didn't mention there was that Anderson Pass is over 12,000 feet. And had that been the only pass, we might have pushed for it. But there's two more passes with the same weather. So it's likely we would have had to wait a day to get over the next one and the next one. There was the potential for us to get stuck between each pass waiting out storms. And that would set us back two to three days on our plan and, and put us in danger of running out of food. It also just put us in danger of having to go down those passes in the snow, not being able to see the trail, not being able to see what rocks were solid and what weren't, and just, it would be really treacherous. We watched that peak all yesterday, and the cloud would float by and the blue skies, cloud, blue skies, and then you cannot tell, but all of a sudden, thunderstorm, 
and snow rolls over. So that's the scary part is you just kind of have to trust the weather and know that if it says 50% chance, it's going to get it. You know, like if anywhere on the whole mountain is going to get it, it's going to be these peaks. Got up over uh, Gunsight Pass and uh, started hiking down. And uh, once we got down below tree line to the, the subalpine basin of Henry's Fork, um, it was really pretty. And we kept looking back up at the pass, you know, looking back up at the pass where we wanted to be. Right up in that pass right there is uh, the backside of the pass that we would have gone through had we continued on. But it goes across the back side of this cliff right here. The whole so knife edge. those two points. That but whole knife edge. on the edge. other side. And when I was up there last, I just remember looking at it and thinking, that is so steep. But yeah, I don't think any of us would want to be up there in however many inches of snow walking down a knife ridge cliff. It still looked horrible. It still looked like, you know, like it wasn't, safe to go over and, and we can see there's no way that we would have the gear for that amount of snow that we can now see that's up there so we kept hiking out we've all been talking about things we've learned um, as we've kind of done this trail so far and even though we're bailing out because of the weather um, all of us are pretty satisfied with our physical performance being able to click off 25 mile days day after day and really be okay with it. Like none of us feel like our bodies are thrashed. You know there's a lot of water in these mountains when there's natural water fountains just springing up out of the ground in the middle of the grass. It's like the worst, you know, it's like, like you feel like you're that dog walking home with his tail between his legs where you're just like, ha. You know, this sucks. So I was in a hurry and uh, my wife helped me pack my bunch of my, a bunch of my food. She wrote little notes all over the bags, the packaging. And I've been loving them all week. They're, I'm a big fan of dad jokes and so everything's covered with dad jokes like this tangerine zest Luna bar. She said, Orange, you glad you have a wife like me? And the answer is yes. The lower we get, the, the more we start to see people. We've been passing a ton of people with massive, massive packs. They look so miserable. All these all these people on like a one or, or two night trip have just insanely huge and heavy packs. And we definitely have work to do about helping people live ultra light a little bit more. It starts snowing again. Just like the saying goes, we're not out of the woods yet. You guys see that? We're a couple miles still from the car. I mean, it's starting to hail and snow again. And at this point, we're 3,000 feet below that pass. Somewhere up there in Anderson and Porcupine Pass, it is dumping snow. I mean, we are massively below the pass. Plus that pass is the highest point. It's taking the worst of all of the weather. And so it was just very clear to us by the time we got to the car and are waiting for the car to get there. And the snow is just coming down even 3,000 feet below that pass that, that we've made the right decision for sure. Um, and the safe decision. We got to the parking lot at, for the trailhead like three minutes to four o'clock, which was when we had planned to meet Eric, our trusty and very flexible shuttle driver. And uh, he showed up about two minutes after four. So we didn't have to wait long at all. It was pretty amazing timing. But what was the biggest surprise was Brendan was in the car with him. I woke up like seven in the morning to two missed calls from Eric who, was, who shuttled us out there and a text from Tayson saying, hey, we got snowed out. I was like, are you serious? Like they only made it one more day, like what is going on? And he's like, we need one of you to pick us up at like this spot. So I like kind of panicked a little bit, like got up, told my brother, like, what's going on? He's like, are you feeling good enough to drive out there? I was like, I don't think I'm gonna drive, but I'm at least gonna go with Eric and pick up the guys. This is the craziest story. So there's a company called Mountain Trail Travel and they do food drops at the bridge that I was telling really? you about. That's like their job is they drop people off for this trail and they do food drops oh, yeah. at Chepita Lake. Yeah. And they are only there for five minutes. They literally drop a food box. I pulled up as they pulled up in their razor and they drove me to Vernal. <laughs> to a hotel, and my brother picked me up in Vernal. They're from Vernal. So. You got a hotel that night. Oh, that is yeah. That's hotel awesome. That night, I have 
The only thing I've eaten since I left you guys, I've eaten half of the quesadilla from Costa Vida. And I we were just going to take you to Costa Vida. <laughs> and I ate some french fries. He went french back to Costa Vida. He goes straight <laughs> back to the store. He went and ate at the same restaurant. I'm like, dude, you were just saying that that's the place that made you sick. I just needed I just needed a freaking, I needed something. The only thing that sounded good was like a quesadilla. I was like, I need to get a quesadilla. <laughs> and I ate some french fries on the way up here. I changed clothes into dry clothes to drive home in for the eight hours of the drive home. And, um, and then the whole time you get to reflect on everything we've done. You could definitely kind of sense the amazement, like the appreciation that they kind of had for the mountain and just that we have this technology to kind of get off trail like that. And like, you definitely sense that, but just also like that kind of innate frustration that was kind of in everybody's hearts at that moment, you know, that we didn't finish something that we really wanted to do and all felt in all honesty, we're physically capable of doing and had put in all the training that I think we needed to do. I think every one of us was ready for that mountain and whether it be snow, sickness, knee pain, whatever takes you off trail, it's never fun. We put in a total of around 80 miles. So we'd gone 80 miles in four days. So to me, that, that means, okay, we definitely, if we had better weather conditions, we definitely could have completed the 115 mile Highline Trail in five days. The biggest thing with all of it is I hate to back off the trail or to, to not complete that goal, but um, that's kind of the best part about what makes the mountains the mountains. What made that trip the trip is if we had just done that trip, if Brandon hadn't gotten sick and we'd just done the 107 miles that we were planning to do and it had gone smooth, like it would have been awesome. It would have been a huge pat on the back, but that's kind of what draws me to go out and do these things is you never know what's going to happen and you have these moments where you're just like this this is nature this is mother nature this is the wild it's unpredictable it's unforgiving and um, you can prepare yourself the best you can you can prepare yourself physically mentally emotionally and with your gear but there's an element of things you can't control and that's what keeps it exciting we had put so much into this whole summer of challenges I mean, when I look at my Strava, I can see here that I did over 350 miles in preparation and, and I guess through the summer. Um, and I did 52,578 feet of ascent. So I'm just 5,000 feet short of, of doing Mount Everest twice. And uh, so we put a lot into it and to not be able to finish was a bummer. But at the same time, probably wouldn't have done 350 miles. The fun, the not so fun, the misery, the, the scenery, and, and, the, and the frustration of not being able to finish the hike. Um, and then, but also the, the energy of like being really motivated to, to get back there and do it again. Hardline challenge as a whole, worth it? Despite the fact that you failed? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I failed at the hardline challenge. No, I, I it was totally worth it. All of us proved to ourselves that we could make it and that we could do it and that we had that physical ability. Um, and to me, that was a huge success. I, I, I know for a fact that this summer I've been probably healthier than I've ever been in my life. And it's felt great. I was thrilled to get to the Beaver, you know, Skyline Trail. Um, that, was, that was my goal, is I wanted to fast pack that entire range and be able to say I did it. And, you know, whenever we drive past there with my family now, I can say, hey, look at this range. As far as you can see, uh, you, I went over that. I, I ran across that. The training was totally worth it. You know, anything, any training is just gonna make you better off. And so I was happy about that. I was happy about the training and, you know, I made it, I know it benefited me and made me healthier. And, um, you know, healthier is better. Did I need to do any of that? Like I could have done the Highline Trail any day of the year. Um, you know, I, I try to stay very fit and uh, I train and exercise year round. Like my, my mantra is to be able to do any trip anywhere, any day of the year without having to do special preparation. Um, that's backpacking. Now running is a different thing. So fast packing, the training definitely, um, you know, made that a much easier thing to do and much more doable. All of your growth comes from pushing past your comfort zones. 
you know, if you only know what you know and you never bother to go learn other things, you, you're gonna be limited to that all the time. Whether it be in business, whether it be in relationships, whatever it is, when you push past those comfort zones, that's when you grow as a person. And this trip, the Hardline um, Challenge as a whole, pushed me constantly past my comfort zone and I had a lot of growth um, within it. And so to me, there's, there's no regrets. Uh, I felt like we left everything we could out on the trail and I left the trail a better person, a better hiker, better athlete than I was before. And now I get to build on that through the winter and through other hikes and come back and set some new goals for the upcoming year. I was a happier person. I enjoyed it more. I felt healthier than I'd ever felt. And I just learned that like you can really do anything that you set your mind on. There's always gonna be obstacles, whether it's sickness or snow or knee pain or back pain. You've heard all of us tie in and talk about the individual struggles, different shoes, testing out different shoes, everything that we've gone through. But if you put your mind to something, like having that motivation is definitely just so driving and so inspiring that you can really conquer any trail or goal that you want, be it physically or mentally, or work, anything. Aside from the fitness that we gained and the product testing that we got to do and the trail time that we got as, as a group, like one of the biggest advantages was just being able to spend that much time with some really great guys. Like we had an awesome time getting to know each other, learning what we can tease each other about, learning what we need to help each other on, and, and just knowing that in business, like when we're doing our normal jobs, we have each other's backs and we know where we're going. And, and uh, that camaraderie and those relationships that, that we built is really what Outdoor Vitals and Live Ultra Light is all about. It's about having those impactful outdoor experiences that help you to be more mentally, physically, and emotionally healthy. So for me, um, the whole challenge really gave a lot. You know, I lost a lot of weight, made my relationships that much better, and, and just had a ton of amazing time out on the trail.